I've witnessed Aaron like almost visibly vomit when a, <laughs> a client sends a, a script a, a script draft visual. over, and it's like we've been in business for twenty five right. years. If <laughs> if a murderer is texting you, he's texting you from an Android phone. Oh, he has to. Say, oh, he has no, to he's, he's, he's a green bubble, be, not right. blue. Oh, nice. Yeah. All right, then we're safe. I'm very well, racist you know, against <laughs> green texts. <laughs> <laughs> Did you quit already? Yeah. I'm just Have like, you God, failed at it. Yeah, I gotta do that. Yeah. <laughs> failed at it. Ryan has failed at filling the refrigerator. It's not worth my time. There are a lot of heartbroken photographers and videographers that are that are hearing that right now because they have spent way too much money on gear Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> right there and that's is. why i always you know, appreciated fresh move media and, and and the team is because you really come in from a fresh perspective huh? fresh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you like that Hey everybody, welcome to the Think Fresh Move Forward podcast. And today we have us have with us Jason Seibel with Performance Management Group. And uh, tell us tell us what uh, who you are and what you do. Well, look, I, I tell people I help companies double and triple their revenue without spending an additional dollar in marketing or advertising. There you go. All right. Yeah. So uh, explain explain to me how I can I, I can double or triple. Now I'm hoping that this is a silver bullet, right? Because <laughs> Because that's what the I'm really one, looking the for. Answer, the I'm really thing. looking for someone to give me the one thing that that uh, that triple uh, that ten x is my business. You fix holes in people's business that yeah. they don't realize that are there. Pretty much. Well, look, there's no silver bullet. Let's make it clear, right? There's right. there's just not. Uh, so so when I say that, you know, I say without marketing or advertising, it's just simply because that there's so many fundamentals that have mm -hmm. been left and ignored or misunderstood, and 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 by addressing those, you can generate tons of revenue and profit for your business and you don't need a bunch of pay-per-click campaigns and advertising that often fail i really appreciate you telling everyone they don't need us uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'm like that's exactly no, no, no. what we do <laughs> no but that's that's yeah. that's really interesting so you're saying that there is uh that people so essentially let me let me build this person in my head then there are, there are people that are biz that are operating businesses that are like boats with holes and they could they could function uh quite well if they plugged up the holes. Well, yeah, we're simply put. So, you know, uh, when it comes to advertising, we know we need a message, right? And often what I find with business owners is they have a great skill. They're very good at what they do. If it's staffing, if it's psychology, if it's solar, selling solar panels, those sorts of things. But, but if I ask them, why you? What do you do and, and what is special about it? They often can't tell me. And if I tell them, oh, by the way, tell me in less than 30 seconds, they can't. And I think that when you're able to address that, why you? What makes you special? Um, what is your market dominating position? What's your unique selling proposition? Then it makes advertising, you know, a successful campaign. Mm -hmm. When you don't, you get things like. Uh, we've been in business for 25 years. Yeah, nobody get, cares yeah, about you, your business in I, 25 years. They don't care. I've been telling people so long and so much <laughs> that please stop verbiage dumping at the beginning of your videos because you have lost people in the first five yeah. seconds by telling people how long you've been in business, like, and trying to introduce yourself right off the bat, like. Yeah, nobody cares until they know what you're able to offer them. That's I've, correct. I've witnessed Aaron like almost visibly vomit when a, <laughs> when a client sends a, a script a, a script draft visual. over, and it's like we've been in business for 25 right. years. <laughs> or if it starts out with I, you know, it's like yes. if people say, uh, you know, what I probably would have said to you five, eight years ago is, well, I'm a business and strategy consultant. Uh, I help companies grow. I've you know got a PhD. I've done turnarounds for Lockheed Martin. Nobody cares. I mean, they'll care later, but they don't care right now. And, and what I like to tell people all the time is there's only two reasons why anybody buys anything ever, and they're entirely emotional. They either have a problem that they don't want, or there's a solution that they want, but they don't have. And what I like to say is uh, everybody hates to be marketed to, but everybody loves to buy. And people buy when they're ready and feel good about doing so. And so... In the context of that, if I go back to this discussion of this business owner, they often don't know. They just started a business, whether it's lawn mowing, whether it, whatever, they're just good at it. And they network and they have friends and they have family and, you know, they start to connect the dots. But eventually they hit this peak mm -hmm. and they say, well, what do you do? We cut lawns. <laughs> Great. What's good about what you do? Why you? Why should I pick you over somebody else? Mm -hmm. 
And so I think when you when you start to work on these various strategies for businesses, you think, well, well, yeah, why you? Um, a, a big statistic I like to say is that uh, you know, or a, a lot of things I like to say about this is is that people buy on value. Mm-hmm. Most people buy on value. Um, this is a script class. Yeah, I mean, right? Yeah. So yeah. so that people buy on value, and when you can't tell the difference between company A and B, what do you have left to compete on? Does anybody know? What's, what do you have left to compete on? Price. Price. Do you want to compete to on price? Because when you compete on price, it's a race to it's the a, bottom. Yeah. Yep. No one likes to compete on price, and most people will not you know, basically evaluate you on price unless they can't tell the difference. And so if you can start to create strategies in your business that helps to differentiate you, wet your, you know, through bundling or through value propositions, either perceived or actual value, then you can increase the perceived or actual value of your product and charge more for it. This is really good. I feel like every business in the world needs to hear this. Well, it's something that I run into all the time. And, you know, it's in my background, I've run all different kinds of business coached all from healthcare to aircraft maintenance to what have you. And there's a consistent problem. They can't tell me why them. They really yeah. can't. And then they go back to the things that they see all the time in business for 25 years. Great. Who cares? Right. Or uh, like a construction company. We use certified subcontractors. <laughs> I mean, I hope so. <laughs> or, no, 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 it gets better than this. Uh, we clean up every day before we leave. <laughs> We're I mean, licensed and insured. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's the big one. <laughs> it happens all the time, right? And so then they go, well, I don't understand why my marketing. I paid Fresh Move all this money yeah. to run my marketing campaign and then get much for it, you know, and, and Fresh Move says, well, why you? And they say, well, well, I've been in business for 25 years and they don't have much to go off of. Mm-hmm. So if you go early into the process and you say, why you? What do you offer? What's different, and how do you go about doing that? There's a process for doing that, and yeah, yeah. And I think what I think it's so true what you're saying because in so many, you know, so much overlap between our businesses and working in the B2B space. Uh, how many times do we start a conversation about building a website, start a conversation about writing a script for a video, or asking them what do they want this video to do or accomplish, yeah. right? Yeah. And how many times we have to t- we have to spend a vast majority of the meeting just talking about what are your unique value propositions? It's a, and it's they amazing. Do not know, right? It's amazing when you start when when you start getting someone into script. And I feel like there is an unspoken value in, in in making videos for your company because you have to put it down. You have to say it. Right. Yeah. You yeah. have to tell people. Yeah. And then like you, in your brain, you start that you start like asking yourself these questions like. Why is this different? Why is this special? And like, we put our customers first. God, come uh, on. Right. <laughs> nah, we, I put you, you know, third. We listen to our customers. <laughs> right? I mean, but it happens all the time. My f- best place to get prospects is the Valpack. How many times have you pulled a Valpack open? Oh, yeah. I've <laughs> thought about reaching. I've literally collected the past two ones, and I've gone through. I'm like, hmm, you could do better. Your website hey, sucks. That's the whole your website tool. Sucks. Yeah. It's a great prospecting yeah. tool. Yeah, it, it is no, great. What you're supposed and to do with a Valpack, you take it and you find an envelope that already has the paid postage stitch. You stick the Valpack in there and you put it in there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what a Valpack <laughs> is. Allegedly. Valpack are these uh, printed, like, uh, you get, it's like a coupon book. Coupon yeah. book. Yeah. 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 And, your wife probably just, throws them away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most people stand over the trash can and drop them in, right? But see, here's the thing, right? So you all, you know, as like a fresh move medium, you know, need that information as input to producing collateral, mm-hmm. whether it's a website or pens well, or images, right? Well, the thing is, though, because most Video. web design agencies, there's, there's, there's two differences. The process of, oh, we'll just design you a website. They find a free template, mm-hmm. and then they mm-hmm. just uh, adjust a few things and then ask the owner to put on stuff. So then you get the aspect, we've been in business for 25 years, so it's yeah. the same boring sales pitch on the website, and it just has some really cool graphics, and that's the extent of it. It's very lazy it's very easy versus the approach we take um much more collaborative it's a lot more collaborative where we're trying to change kind of like what you're doing with the with the client um because at the end of the day it's your sales tool it is your brick and mortar that is online it's how people will judge you online so we don't take the easy way approach this is why we charge a lot more yes you could pay a college student five hundred dollars or fifteen hundred dollars to design your website but it's going to look like it 
yeah. and look like shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> here's the thing, and this is why I talk about this no cost, like, you know, how I introduce myself, right? So wh- where, where, I, where, where I think we part sometimes is I'll work with a client and say, when you go to the chamber, mm-hmm. how, do you enter yourself, hi, I'm Jason. I'm a business and strategy consultant. Nobody cares, right? Yeah. But if I go in and how do you know your market dominating position is working? Well, I help companies double and triple their revenue without spending an additional dollar in marketing or advertising. And about 50% of the time, people say, I could use that. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> people how do you drop, do that? Yeah. People are going to drop their phone and actually start They're going to say, how do you do that? You start a conversation mm-hmm. and you start down that path. And that's how you know that you're hitting the, the, it, the number one you know issue on the top of their mind. Because see, I... What I also say to people, and I know you guys too, is you have about four and a half seconds to awaken the subconscious or you're moving on. Yeah. And the easiest yeah. place to find that, and you guys are in web all the time, is that's called an abandonment rate on a website. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And so it's, you, it's, it's a hook. Uh, like we watch our analytics and like we try to get those first five seconds are the most critical in our ad. Or they're yeah. gone. So they're, they're, yeah. on, they're on yeah. YouTube, it's called a view duration. So uh, YouTube likes promoting content the longer someone watches content. So if you have a huge drop-off rate in a video, YouTube sees this as this video is I- irrelevant or not as interesting, therefore it's not gonna boot, pump it up versus if I have a short where people are like, that click uh, or that grab is instant and the person watches the whole clip. So like if you have like a 93%, uh, which is really good, that's a solid video. YouTube's gonna push that up versus like 10%. Yeah, it's a crappy video, crappy topic, no one really cares. Let's just shove it down over here. And and that yeah. that presents itself in websites and ads, videos, everything. But what you're even describing is just like an initial conversation with Correct. someone, right? Like Well, and that's I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Right. So that's why like where we depart, so to speak, cuz mm-hmm. yeah, we collaborate very early on in front end of conversations, but what I would say is, well, yeah, it, it should end up in your website, your advertising, your promotional videos, all that absolutely. But how you introduce yourself? What about in a, a presentation? You know, uh, what do typically people sales pitches start with? We've been in business for 25 years. We're in this industry. Why not hit them right out of the gate with your MDP? Um, you know, salespeople. What uh, is MDP? Market dominating position. Okay. Yeah, sorry, MDP. So, you know, it's that's that's where I think the rubber meets the road. And even using it for the the sales folks. So there's a chemical company in Florida, and the long story short is they have a biodegradable product, works really well. But they're really struggling. Why them? So after like, and it took me months to pull this out of them, but long story short of it, we come to find out that their product never separates or degrade, which is how they were able to draw, uh, you know, revenue off of their competitors because their competitors, the way they mix the products and long story short, they'll degrade and separate after about 10 to 12 days. Well, this company, Sun Pro Supply, their products never separate or degrade, and they guarantee the effectiveness of them for life. So their little pitch that we put together, and it's actually on their homepage now, it says, um, unlike the competition, our products will never separate or degrade. We guarantee the effectiveness of our products for life. And that's all they have to say to people because that's actually the number one issue because in that industry, Mm -hmm. applying a chemical like a degreaser to an engine, so you can either use your elbows or you can let the product work. And if you put the product work and it's effective, you're, you will cut your time down, you know, 90%. Yeah. Well, if you go buy a big 55 gallon drum and in, and in two weeks it's separated and worthless, you're, you're kind of ticked off. Yeah. So my point about it is, and now boom, their sales are really driving. It's so easy for their salespeople to say it. And then what's the irresistible offer that comes in behind it? They said, look, come up with your biggest, baddest, ugliest, nastiest job. I'll leave you this gallon jug and I'll pick it up when it's empty. And they have about an 80 to 90% conversion rate. Wow. 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 So there's no, you know, so there's no, um, there's no big ads. There's no pay per clicks. There's no, there wasn't really any of that. And I think what I try to get clients to do initially Mm -hmm. is to reset and get their head wrapped around it. And often when I get into engagements, that it will lead to a website, yeah. right? It'll lead to digital, but if they can't get the basics into place and how they introduce themselves, and you have to test these MDPs. You know, it's hard to go come up with seven MDPs, you're not sure which one's gonna work. Oh, let me go build my website around it. Oh, really? nope, just kidding, that doesn't work, right? This, so this we'll is test really, them. This is super interesting. I didn't know that you operated in this way uh, because that would be a, an extremely valuable thing f- for a script writing room. 
right? Mm. Uh, because that's like so someone who's like able to like get the MDP out and like and uh, work with a creative who's who's making a hook, for, uh, bringing also a visual element into it. That would be that would just be a powerhouse. You know, it's like. interesting. Yeah, so it's interesting where these where I pick up and let off because this is just a small entry point. So if you think about really what I do, it's really some upfront work. So let me back up. Typically. Prospects come to me because they want to generate, re well, actually one of a couple different ways. One is they can't generate revenue, they're not generating the profits and those sort of things. And about 50% of the time I find out it's a back-end pro delivery problem. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes I get into it's a messaging problem. Mm -hmm. And then what I'll do is I'll do some work up front to generate, I'm going to call kind of these draft concepts and test them a little bit, and then that's about where I stop. And then I hand it off to the experts who script right, who really get down to the itsy-bitty details. Um, but there's some generic testing that needs to happen up front, and we'll start to really hone in. And before we ever create a website, before any of that's ever done, and then we land with about the 80% answer because we're trying to get traction right now, especially if they're in trouble, um, then that's kind of good enough. Then the business level's off. Then you go build the site or do collateral. Yeah, it's I, just how I, I think work. what I find most interesting about the, the MDB approach, right, is the idea of like, okay, you're giving a clear guidance and vision to all the stakeholders in the business. Of like, this is what we're known for, right? So a salesperson is now no longer just thinking about the million pieces value props that they could be promoting, throwing mm. mud against the wall. Oh, we oh. do this. Oh, we do this. Or feature dumping, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. We have this feature. We have this feature, whatever. And Versus let's, now let's, they have a clear. Let's have so, graphic design that has all of our features on it. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I must like kill you guys all the time. Yeah. yeah. It's I have, frustrating. I have another question. Yeah. So that's more focused on the message um, in business consulting. What else are the main problems you find? Because I know you do more than just that. Yeah. You <laughs> talked about operations. Yeah. Right? Because that seems yeah. so very high level. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you've said it in a very elegant yeah. way, which is great. Um, but what are other things that you see that a lot of business owners make mistakes on? Um, that you've seen case, like you mentioned, like oh. uh, messaging is one thing that you see on every business, but what's another thing that you see a lot of business owners do that could be rectified? Yeah, I think, <laughs> uh, a very loaded question. It is a very loaded question. I think that if, if I really look at businesses that have been, I'm going to call mostly successful, you know, it, it, what's interesting is I, I think, I think the statistics about 90% of all small businesses in America make less than a hundred thousand dollars a year. That's kind of crazy, right? Um, and so typically what I see is somebody who gets up to about the five, 600,000 a year kind of mark, they're small, they've got just a couple of employees, what have you, and they're struggling to break through. Typically what I see is they haven't built repeatable processes and metrics and those sort of things to know systemically what's going on. And they also don't know how to break out of going from a startup to what I call a professionally managed business. Yeah, that's that's really good. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, uh, we ahead. had a we had a guy on recently who said who said that the difference. But what I'm thinking that he's describing is the difference between those two is uh, one is someone who is owning a job and one is someone who's own, owning a business. Correct. So there's you know they say single shingle. You ever yeah. heard of that, right? So yeah, I mean uh, what I actually call it is a lifestyle business, right? Or a business where you really want to get something. And it, when I think about my ideal customer, my ideal customer is. I want to grow, pivot, or I'm in trouble. And those are typically my best. Why? Because they're energized. They want to change. That's what gets me going. That's what gets me excited. I don't, I don't need their money. I want to do something that I love every single day. And that is seeing results in the business and the owner getting what they want out of that business. Who is not my ideal client? I, I, I want to make some decent money. I want to work when I want, how I want, you know, what have you, and call it a day. Mm -hmm. And that's just not really... My, my ideal customer. There's right. people out there for that, but that's not my, my shtick. I'm looking for someone who is looking for growth and hyper growth and pivot or acquire or, or sell uh, is kind of another area where they're like, look, I want to get $2 million out of this business. What do I need to do? Okay, do these seven things. Let's clean up your OPEX. Let's get some growth in here. Call it a day, list it, go get your 2 million bucks, go home. So and, and and what I'm hearing from you and 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 in all our conversations, it's been 
uh, much more focused on achieving very specific quantifiable things. Right? Right. To your point, you just made, right? Which is like, okay, you have a number in your mind for what you want to sell the business at. Let's talk about ways to achieve exactly that one thing, right? right. And I think the, the other person you described that doesn't really fit your scenario very well is somebody that's kind of just going with the flow and, you know, it's not, it, there isn't like real, like, like narrow and maybe maybe there is a, de a degree of like uh, somebody has that ambition but they don't know how to quantify it yet right which somebody like you could help with or right? they're fearful they don't know how to make the investment yeah. but I think complacent is yeah. not my ideal customer yeah. right who's like hey look I make 600 grand a year I don't want any more stress I have everything I ever want and that's great yeah and that, that is for them but that's not necessarily for me so I think you also make a good point you know, and, and, and how I like to differentiate myself, so to speak, is one thing that Lockheed Martin taught me was it's all about outcomes, um, outcome driven. There's targets, there's goals, there's things that you want to achieve. And typically the entry point with a, a prospect of mine is um, typically they talk about generating revenue and they think, oh, I have a revenue problem. Therefore, I must have a marketing problem. Therefore, I must uh, do more marketing and, and those so, sorts of things. <clears throat> I have a question. This is on, I would say, your work history with Lockheed Martin. So. Obviously, we're not the typical type of customer for Lockheed Martin, uh, since mostly, correct me if I'm wrong, Lockheed Martin does most business with the government. How do you optimize Lockheed Martin for generating more revenue? Like, what are things that you saw that even a business as big as they are um, make more money? Well, um, you know, look... Um, <laughs> It's interesting because Lockheed Martin is really made up of a lot of different business. First of all, they've made many acquisitions and those sorts of things. And I think sometimes you traditionally think about Lockheed, the aircraft, the planes, the missiles. The That's a different business model. They're doing billions and billions and billions of dollars at a very low kind of a margin. It's a volume game. But they also have other businesses where, and one that I was the CEO of, which was firm fixed price contracts. And the more you can optimize out of that business, the more profit you can make. And there's a ton of places to go. And it was a subsidiary that did $230 million a year. It's doing a half a billion right now um, or more. Um, and so there's certainly places to go. I think when you think about optimizing the business, typically what I have seen and like where I like to come into businesses and, 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 the, and what I love about having the diversity of my experience is when you bring in someone who's particularly and said just a vertical market my personal opinion is many of them i won't say all of them but many of them bring the old same tired kind of reuse things and i think that when you bring in adjacencies into from other businesses of what they've done and or applied or used what have you, you can come up with an interrupt you can disrupt some industries by bringing in adjacencies. I mean, even my PhD, I took an adjacency that was applied to something entirely separate, doing logistic regression analysis, applied it to dis software decision that not many, no one had really done before, and called it a dissertation, right? And so you can do that in business, and that's how you interrupt and disrupt. Um, and so I think when I look at, you know, what I did, especially at Lockheed Martin, was optimizing the business and getting so many businesses that are stuck in startup and becoming that professionally managed. So for example, QTC, they did independent medical evaluations for the VA. They did 500,000 of them a year, 1,300 employees. I walk in and the stuff that they're doing, shifting paper around and those sort of things was astonishing. Going through four pallets of paper twice a week huh. you know, at these various companies. And wow. when I left, they had 300 less employees, they had uh, improved their output about 70% and they were using almost no paper in three years. And so going in and optimizing these businesses by looking at their processes and those sort of things is the back end of what I'll say I've done. So I work on the front end, the marketing, getting folks in, but well, what I'll tell you, and I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but companies say, Hey, I want more business. I'm like, if I bring you another piece of business you're you are going to implode because you can't even deliver <laughs> you what you have yeah, you don't yeah. have the systems so place. then that's yeah. why i say it's almost a split 50 50 you're going back to some of these businesses and looking at them i uh, literally i'll go in and it starts out as a revenue i want more revenue and then i start to kind of peel the look underneath the hood and just start going through some very basic questions who are you what do you do org charts policies procedures you start to uncrack and very quickly i can figure out whether this business has been meant to scale and if it can scale and uh you know i looked at one 
one business I won't name because it would be embarrassing, they had a 78% return rate to their customer after an installation. That's uh that's problem. That's rough. That's problem. And no they had a lot of assumptions why and the other thing I'll say is I never believe what a customer t- you know what the owner tells me ever because it's <laughs> never right because they believe they have an assumption. But I'll go, "Hey, why do you think you're returning back to that customer and they have an opinion. I said, how about this? Just for one week, I want you to write down every reason why you've went back. Come to find out, 60% of the problems were tied to one issue. So we went in the front of the line and fixed it, and they cut it down by about 50%. Wow. So, so, so like I said, there's often a front-end side, and then there's a really a back-end side, and they haven't built to scale, and they start throwing resources at it. They're not making money. They're not making a profit, and they're in trouble. And so that's where I go. <clears throat> So, like, um, whether you like Elon or not, <laughs> um, Twitter fired essentially 80% yeah. of their staff. Yeah. And they're still operating. Yes, they are. And most of that money, they were, he was going to be, I remember him saying, watched a, an interview where they were going to be insolvent if they um, kept going in that rate. And the fact that you could fire that many people and still be operating at that level for what, for what that is. And he even said that a lot of uh, CEOs of a lot of the companies are now starting to take notice and they're firing. I would say most of these tech companies um, firing a lot of their staff. Well, there's no, there's no, yeah, there's no doubt that it's particularly in the tech space, there's bloat, of course, right? And 80% you know, though? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't, I, I, I That's think you could also, <laughs> you'd also it argue new whether they're, what was that? It was, it's new and shiny. Yeah. A new industry. Yeah. yeah. A new trades. Sure. Right? You can do sure. that without a college education, take some kind of boot camp and boom, make 100K a year. Yeah. I'm yeah. in Fang now. Well, like, like yeah, Facebook you know. was hiring yeah. people um, to, and paying them $250,000 a year just so the competition wouldn't hire them. And that person literally did nothing. There, there could be strategies for that. Like, yeah. I, I get that's it. What, but hey, that's, damn. That's what a lot of those, <laughs> those mergers and acquisition of these social platforms, that's what they've done. They've, they've uh, found a startup that was potentially a disruptor in the industry, bought them, and – you know, tabled it or put it in the drawer, right? And That's so, what right. happened with um, Starbucks when they bought Tivana. Mm-hmm. They bought it to put it out of yes. business. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah. let me tell you here what my personal opinion is about that. So the problem is the incentives of the company are not aligned, right, um, you know, uh, with the, the ultimate objectives of what they're trying to do. And if you look at Twitter, in my opinion, it was bloated because it wasn't here to serve its shareholders. Mm-hmm. It was it had an agenda. It's not... A, yeah. We don't have to go there, yep. but I'm just saying it served an agenda. Um, I mean, you can look at, I don't know, an ice cream company. They're killing their their parent company over their choices. It's okay. That's their choice, but I'm just saying they, they all have their different opinion. So if, but if you realign back to what the shareholders and its profitability and doing distributions and this one, you stop to optimize. Talking about a company with a U. Could be. We did some <laughs> video work for that company. <laughs> you know. I'll, t- I'll tell you later. So, you probably have no idea that they're. They so I think I think so. So what I'm saying is, is that, um, you know, I've got a company I just started working with a little while ago and revenues are slightly down and headcount is way up and productivity is not where it needs to be. And they just kind of lose their way. And you start getting back to basics and you go, well, what's the productivity? How are they measured? How are they incentivized? Why? Why? Who are they doing? What are their org chart? What's their roles, responsibilities? And you start getting back to basics. Uh, it's not hard to get a business back to profitability. And I think if you say, well, what did Elon Musk do? He said, looked at it and said, who are we? What are we here to serve? We need to make a profit or we're going to be insolvent. So there's an urgency there. And uh, whether you like the method to the madness about how he did it, which could probably be written about in a lot of management books, but it had to happen. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, if you say, what are some other themes? I think a, a, a lot of these businesses uh, kind of outscale or need, you know, out, out um, overcome the owner and they don't know what to do and they just start kind of hobbling things together. Just to hire all survive. these people. They're just like, yeah, hire all these people. I want to do this. I want to do this. If, you know, things look good. They stop paying attention. They over delegate and they lose sight of their business. They don't have dashboards and this sort of thing. So often I'll go in and just start building some very basic dashboards. Like, you know, this company I just started working with, I plotted their revenue for three years, their gross profit for three years, their salaries for three years, and just said, now look at that graph. Just visualize your data. What does it tell you? And then like the tears start to practically roll. 
because somebody was not paying attention and you can see the 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 salaries are skyrocketing i mean uh, they are skyrocketing and revenue has got a trend line down and the profitability is now headed into the tank and you know what in probably three months we'll get that all corrected and get them back in and we've got some basic dashboards in place and now they're getting control of that company and it comes back to profitability and spend any money in marketing or advertising. Don't mean to hurt your feelings, but yeah, no, no, no I, I, there will be listen, a time for that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think I think what you're describing to is interesting because you're saying, you know, there are these common themes that go across every industry, right? And right. and almost every size business, right? I mean, every. there's you know, small business, medium sized business. We're talking about large, big tech companies, right? right? There are some common themes that are there, and you know, obviously, when you have a small business, it becomes more like clear and obvious because the owner is so vital to the success in the early stages, right? Right. But if they're not able to make that move like you were describing, right, from, you know, they get to that five, six hundred, seven hundred K mark and not able to break through, then you become, you know, then it's like a people problem, right? Right. Um, you know, so do you find that business problems are people problems or yeah. do you find that it's systems problems or a lack of, or a combination of both? I think of I often find it's really skill. I mean, you know, uh, gosh, I'm going to make a lot of lawyers mad. Hopefully I don't get sued for this. But some of the worst <laughs> business owners are lawyers. How many business classes did a lawyer take? Unless they're like CPA discipline or what have you, they really struggle, right? Yeah. How many psychologists have taken a business class? None. Doctors are yeah. terrible at running businesses. Doctors. Yeah. Yeah. Another one. Admins run hospitals and not doctors. Well, yeah. you're exactly right. And so I think I look at it and say there's a basic skill set that is often missed because it's interesting, and what I love about what I do every day is how people start their businesses is really some fascinating things. Mm -hmm. There's a guy that I ran into, very short story, but really cool. I get, there's a guy I ran into, uh, he was out of France, he was a perfume uh, maker, okay? And that's where he had spent his time. So long story short, he ended up in the non-alcoholic bourbon business. No, I don't know why you do that. Non-alcoholic bourbon. Non-alcoholic That's an insult. Bourbon <laughs> is, uh, makes me want to cry. But let's just say, go with me here, okay? Big okay. masochist. So yeah, what's the ahead. issue? What's the issue is the non-alcoholic uh, for many, many years uh, did not have the burn, which is what people uh, in part enjoy about the bourbon. And you can only call bourbon if it's made in the United States. Well, that's true, too. So <laughs> uh, so, 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 I think that the, 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 the interesting thing about it was he said he was doing some work. He pulled his back and put one of these pain-killing things on his back. Well, he peeled it off and because he was working outside and it started slipping off. And, and he had rubbed his lips and they started to burn. So he looked at the package and figured out what was in it. And they started mixing that and count, came up with a formula and added in the bourbon, made one of the first bourbons that had the burn. Isn't that cool? I hope that's yeah. organic. Um, yeah, well, yeah, hopefully yeah. it's good to adjust. Well, are you, are, are you going to argue with me about no, 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 no. Uh, the health impact of the non-alcoholic <laughs> bourbon over here? Is that, what, is that, is that the uh, argument? Yeah, he had his pain pack <laughs> and like, um, the chemicals. Yeah. <laughs> this this is is it. <laughs> yeah, right. Don't rub your eye. Eureka. So, yeah. So, but I think that the point about that is, Gosh, so many people I know, they don't wake up and go, oh, I'm going to start a fill in the blank. They often fall into these businesses. My, mm -hmm. my, old, you know, my old man that had this chemical company and commercial pressure washing company and what have you, which is the guy was, after he sold it, the guy that I was helping, you know, correct it. He fell into that. He was in the chicken business for Tyson for 30 years and managing plants. How do you, go, you know, he just fell into it. Um, so, so many of them do that and, and they may not necessarily have the skills. So then the question is, well, what do you do? Obviously you can bring in sales consult or, uh, you know, strategists and coaches and those sort of things to help create the practical things to provide you the guidance. The other, you know, and the other thing I think that prohibits some of these business owners from really jumping out is they're afraid. They're afraid to ask. They're afraid to really rely on folks. And it's lonely at the top. You know, I always say people. I've been a CEO. I had 15, 1,400 employees working for me. It's lonely at the top. People only come to your office with problems, <laughs> right? There's never any good news ever, yeah. right? And, um, you know, you don't really have a lot of people that you can really confide in. So I've always had external people kind of helping me because I think sometimes you just want to do a sanity check. Like, hey, I saw this. Like, what do you think about that? You know? And so while I'm not saying the the coaching business is the kind of psychological side because it's certainly not my shtick. I'm a outcomes driven. It's not the kind of soft. You're not, a life, thing. you're not a life coach. Life coach, yeah. 
the 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 point about it though is is that there's some skills and those sort of things that go along with it and if you can bring in and sur- some of the best best business owners that have a discipline in what they do that they're very good at also recognize what they are not good at and they bring in experts to do it you know if you know you find a web development company who yeah any you know developing the web page not that hard 80 to 90 percent of the work is what goes in front of it (laughs) right like pushing the bits out is not super hard so bring in an expert you know bring in an an expert in videography or otherwise you're going to look like a kid you know had produced it on their cell phone um you know it's bringing in a cpa firm to do your taxes it's why i have a financial planner because while i understand the concepts i am not the expert and so I think if you can recognize and appreciate what you do and don't know and then bring in those pieces of expertise, that's really when you see the businesses arc up. Well, and the other thing I'm hearing you say, too, I think is interesting and something we talk a lot about, right, is how can you disrupt the market and not sound like everyone else, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that is like a, a critical component of what we do. We work with people of all different industries, mm-hmm. right, because we're coming in to that industry without this like set uh, method of standards. Playbook. Say, this is it, right? Yes. Like in our space, you know, and you have this in yours, I'm sure with the consulting space, but in our space, there are so many people that say, all right, we just do auto shops. That's what we do. We do digital marketing for auto shops and they basically have the same cookie cutter playbook that they apply in every market. And go look the at country, them. Right? And they all look the they same. They all look the same. With different words on them. Yeah, yeah. And that doesn't differentiate yourself, right? There and that's is. why I always you know, appreciated Fresh Move Media and, and, and the team is because you really come in from a fresh perspective. Huh? Fresh yeah. Yeah, 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 you like that? I didn't even, you know. But but seriously about this, it's like, so so I think you can pull it back. And, in you know, in the discussion, I've seen you guys do work um, for mutual clients and stuff where – Hey, we saw this at this site. This worked over here. What if we interject that and combine that with another thing I just saw over there? Wow, that would be an awesome combination. And and I and I think that's again from a a a, a performance and on the on, on the operation side of the business and other areas that's similar to what what I like to do too. Is hey, look, there's not a one size fits all. Yeah. Um. And um. You know, it's why you know I I I like to take best of breed. Um, you know, applications. There's a lot of philosophies and books written and those sort of things about, you know, uh, different uh, methodologies. Um, you know, you've heard of rocks and, you know, and those OKRs and, you know, they all. Um, but, but really, if you're able to pick and choose based on the application what uh, best fits for that particular uh, business or customer, then I think that's where you get the win win. And then you can start to differentiate and discriminate. At the end of the day, you've got to have a willing prospect yeah. Right, yeah. to take a leap of faith. Because you're not ultimately, like, you can't be the one implementing everything, yeah. right? They have to implement at some point, right? They have to drive it forward. That's yeah, right. we've had yeah. clients where we just lay out what they need to do, and they're just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do you deal with a, with a commodity, that, with, with a client that is like, found themselves in the middle of the commodity trap? That's a great, great question because it it's, happens all the time. I mean, I own a franchise. They couldn't differentiate me from the guy and gal across the street and a guy across the street. And this is where we talk about marketing and what have you, and I'll get right back to it. I understand what you're saying. But I want to drive the point home. Uh, so I had a small startup business start down the road competing with my franchise in that space. Um, they were killing me. I... Quadru- I had more marketing spend. I spent six hundred thousand dollars a year in marketing, and they're killing me. They probably have eight bucks. And I tell people, you don't need a bigger hammer; you need a sharper nail. Mm. So, getting back to this concept of, I'm in a commodity space. Like, I got a client that's in staffing. How many staffing companies knock on my door? Especially when I was at the government, yeah. Backy, Lockheed oh, yeah. Martin. Oh yeah. I was Everyone. like, shoe fly. I mean, like, please go away, <laughs> right? I just go. And then, you know, even one of the guys that I met, I was, you know, I gave him a job that I didn't even think existed, and they filled it. So I. I felt obligated, right? <laughs> to give it a <laughs> um, you can differentiate, um, and there's a couple of uh, different ways that I'll just kind of throw at you. First is often there are benefits to your product or service that may not be spoken, okay? 
So um, you can go and crawl the space and look at your competitors, and they may be doing these things, but they don't bring them up, okay? Mm -hmm. um, there's messaging that you can look at that might be irritants in the industry that drive people crazy, you know, about that industry. And so you can begin to highlight some of those things about who you're not. Like, for example, when I said that chemical company, unlike the competition, our products will never separate or degrade. That's a known thing. In fact, when they go to do the sales, the first thing that the prospect says is, what's the shelf life? The first thing. Now, I would probably say that biodegradable chemicals is about as commodity as it can come, right? Mm -hmm. But we differentiated actually just through a set of words and a guarantee that nobody else was willing to offer. In fact, kind of made them look bad. In fact, it's so bad in that industry that they deliver the 55 gallon drums in dark drums so that you cannot see that they've separated inside. Ah, wow. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Whereas the company in Florida uses clear white and you can see it. So you can differentiate. The other things that you can do, and I'll just throw out, is you can bundle, you can add a layer of value or service. So I had an Acumatica client, in, uh, you know, which is at ERP, uh, they're a reseller. How many resellers are there? 100,000, I don't know, I mean, there's a lot. Well, what we did was we started building value packages around it so that when you came in, um, you could, like one of the big things they did is a lot of ERPs are a big expense up front, like 100 grand, and then you pay for the service. Well, we came up with a program that would spread that out so they would kind of take the risk up front and then it would be like eight grand a month for three years or four years. So what it did was it lowered the barrier to the business because the business, the response to these mid-sized small businesses was I can't afford it, I don't have the money. Well, now we've lowered that barrier, right? The other thing is they kind of made more all-inclusive. So they won't nickel and dime you like a lawyer. A lot of software companies like, oh, you know, every 15 minutes, every 10 minute calls. They eliminated that into a single package kind of as a service that's all-inclusive at a fixed price that lowered that barrier, killing it, mm. right? Commodity service. So you can start to massage these things in a different way that creates the actual or perceived value based on the things that drive people crazy. Yeah. Right? That's how you that's how you break down the commodity, make yourself look different, even though you're about doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, uh, like there's a lot of there's a lot of businesses that find and a lot of business owners that find themselves in like like uh, something, some, something like a roofer, right? Correct. A roofer is going to have a tough time <laughs> being like, I'll put a roof on your house. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't have different products than someone else, but I'll, I'll put the other things on there if you pay for it. Well, and the thing like about it is, is that the there's things. other things like, you know, solar panels, mm -hmm. right? Uh, one of my clients. So one of the things that was typical in the solar panel industry, five years of warranty on the labor, 25 years on the panel. Mm -hmm. well, what do I do after five years? Well, they said, we'll match 25 year, 25 year labor and warranty, a guaranteed production, 98% on the panels for 25 years. No one really does it. That's a differentiator. Yeah. And you know, the interesting thing about it, I always ask people is, so what's the risk? You know, people are afraid to do it. Like a realtor, I was talking to a realtor and I said, what if you guaranteed that you would sell someone's house in 90 days or you would charge them zero fee. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yeah, it was like, you know, like a uh, panic attack yeah, right, yeah. right there, right? I, I, I can sweats. see it now <laughs> with the average realtor knowing right? I've worked with them. Now, here's the thing I said, let me ask you a question. How many homes in the last year have you not sold in 90 days? Well, just a couple. How many customers would you think you would get if you had that guarantee? Oh, wow, that would be a game changer. So what if you did have to sell a couple for nothing to get 30 more? It wouldn't matter, yeah. right? And so it's breaking these old traditional yep. habits and offering a risk reversal, a value proposition, an off-ramp. Oh, that we haven't even gotten into downsell. We haven't gotten into bundling. All these other things that you can generate revenue without spending money in marketing or advertising very quickly right out of the gate yeah yeah i could see realtors are so focused on that commission since everything's not one deal at a time why they would freak panic. out yeah. they would panic when you say yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh we never I, do I, that i've seen agents where they say if we don't sell your house we'll buy it from you but 
Well, they don't tell you is they're buying it from you at wholesale pricing. So then, well, they can... <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I and you're bringing up. I mean, the, you know, uh, uh, kind of the argument was, well, what if they price it at a million dollars? It's only worth a half a million. Well, then you never sign up to list it. I mean, don't be an idiot. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, have some uh, conditions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, yeah. but you know, it's interesting. Here's another one. I didn't come up with this, but this is through. I'm affiliated with about 150 other people, kind of in this network. And one of the things that they did was. Um, they would fund so 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 realtors know, and we all kind of have a general sense that uh, when you go to sell a home, what drives up the value? Like master bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, kitchen, kitchen yeah. kind of about the three. Mm-hmm. Well, what they would do is they would fund. They would basically value the price of the house, and they'd say, "We're going to spend twenty five thousand or thirty thousand. We're going to front the money, and we're going to do all the maintenance and do all the upgrades that are going to make this thing amazing." And then they would split the delta off of the as the, kind of the as is price versus what the to be price would be, mm-hmm. and they would take the risk, killing it. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's actually uh, two of the brokerages that I work with doing that. Correct. So, Gonna have See, one solid sell- contract though for that. Damn, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but the point about it is, is that you know, it's the 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 point about it is, is that. You see, you're in a commodity space. Realtors, millions. You can, I could go get my license, study for it, get my license in 90 days, and be another realtor out there, right? Yeah, one of four thousand in Richmond. Right. Yeah. Well, and, seven. And, and oh, seven thousand. Seven thousand realtors in Richmond. So, so my, That's you know, and you've got many. the moonlighters to the very professional to the ones that are very mm-hmm. good at it. How do you differentiate yourself? There are really a lot of ways, and what I try to do from folks because like I said I kind of do that front end work um, I, I don't take it through copy that's not my expertise the scripting that's not my but it really getting the foundations down of asking a lot of those really hard why questions and if I can get them to start you know kind of circling full back if I can get them to start introducing themselves in a different way mm-hmm. doing proposals in a different way just making a tweak to their original site with some sort of MDP could get their salespeople to also recite the MDP and get a little elevator pitch going, and you start to hit these very basics, you know, in place, they can get an immediate lift. Yeah. So usually I'll go two places. I'll try to hit them on the front end on the lift, and then the first thing I'll do is start to sweep the OPEX and look at the unbelievable number of software, you know, con- uh, canvas and everything else they've subscribed to because I'll say, I'll go through their OPEX and say, if it doesn't help you acquire or retain or deliver a customer, get rid of it. And you'd be surprised <laughs> what all is in there. So you kind of improve the bottom line. That's a really drive good. drive the top line revenue. That's a really good nugget, right? S- s- say that again for me. If it doesn't help you acquire, retain, or deliver on a customer, get rid of the expense. I tell you what, there are a lot of there are a lot of heartbroken photographers and videographers that are, that are hearing that right now because they have spent way too much money on gear. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, that so helps you gear. deliver on a customer, right? But if you know if the additional piece like uh, of equipment is not going to help you yet pick up another customer, and it's because you want the latest and greatest, is that really the best spend? Right. Of your yeah. Dollars? yeah. That's yeah. a that's that's a hard pill to swallow because like you get because you love the gear. I you, you know, love the stuff. Man, the the nugget I'm getting out of that <clears throat> is just the fact that almost everything you said there had nothing to do with research and development and making your product better or your service any better. It's about repackaging the way it's presented, right? Which is interesting right. to me. And and don't get me wrong, like there's always a place for, hey, if your product is not as good as the competition, sure. could you improve it? Are there different things you could do? Uh, but I mean, for a small business that's like, hey, this is this is what our offering is. How can we just do a better job putting this offering in front of people? So you know what's interesting? You just made me think of something. So I had a client that was an industrial occupational psychologist. They did assessments and executive assessments and helped hire people and all that. Their product was by far superior to anything that was on the market, but they were flat for a decade. $1.8 million, $2 million business. And come, you know, after having spent some time with them, they would get on the phone with these clients and talk gibberish and so far ahead of them because they, you know, one of the classic mistakes is telling your prospect how smart you are, proving to them how smart you are. Mm -hmm. They don't give a damn how smart you are. I mean, it will matter later, but that's not how you're going to lead into that conversation. And their competitors that had inferior crappy products, you know, were running circles around tens and hundreds of millions of dollars running circles in them. Why is that? They had a better message. 
I mean, if you go back way back to the Novell and Windows days, I mean, that's old, right? I'm dating myself. Novell was a superior product to the Microsoft platform at the time. Microsoft killed them. They had a better message, better solution. Every one Novell server I retired, I had to put three Microsoft servers in its place, right? But they had a better message, a better delivery, a better vision, and better them in every way, shape, or form. And it was an inferior product, right? And so it is about the messaging and getting back to that and understanding the unique selling proposition and understanding the problem your prospects have. Microsoft really drove the coupling of the desktop and the server at the time and those sort of things in a way that <clears throat> Novell could not. I got two things for you. It reminds me of... Um, Thanks for joining the podcast. I know. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got like two hours of sleep, so I'm kind of like half yeah. awake right now. But the, the whole... I, I get the kind of the question of what software should I buy? And I don't lead with the question. I go, why do you want it? What, what's it going to solve? What's the process it's going to do? Because we have... You know, all these project management tools that are out there. Okay, what's it going to do for you? Do you actually understand what your process is? Do you actually right. have it written down? Correct. Because if you don't, you're going to waste your time, and that's still money that you're going to spend on something that you haven't even purchased yet. And then right. uh, the second thing, I just thought about this when you are talking about Windows, is that uh, if you ever watch a horror movie or some kind of action film, uh, the message between, like, Windows and Apple if you ever want to figure out who the villain is, just watch who's uh, holding a phone in their hand because Apple will never put uh, a villain holding a phone. So oh, they'll never put their stamp of they approval will, they, on a villain. It, 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 no villain. So what's the, what's no, the takeaway? <laughs> no bad guy can hold an Apple so device. So if, <laughs> if a murderer is texting you, he's texting from an Android phone. Oh, he has to be. Oh, has nice. to be. He's a green bubble, be. not yeah, blue. Right. Oh, nice. yeah. All right, then we're safe. I'm very well, racist you know, against <laughs> green texts. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, well, in the, in the, if someone likes that green text, it's even worse, right? Uh, yeah. Because then you get three more texts. Oh, my God. It's so yeah, bad, yeah. right? And it's worse on Windows. So I think what you actually brought up was I, I thought it was very interesting. What I thought you were going to take about time. The other big thing, you know, and this just like I said, these hit me as we have these conversation. And 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 uh, Ryan, when you mentioned, hey, what's a big thing? You know, when that that I see in business owners, business owners cheap. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, I can run my QuickBooks on my own because I know how to do it. I don't want to pay an accountant to do that. That's a waste of money. And what I, I just had a conversation with a gentleman, a, a new client that I picked up this morning in Northern Virginia, and I said, do you know that your hourly rate is probably $3,000 an hour? That's how much money you generate. Do you really think, because I was looking at his onboarding process, and he ha he's like the chief operating officer, and he's got his name, send the offer letter, his name, follow up with the offeree, his name, follow is that the best use of your time? That's like a $20 an hour job. Do don't you, I think that they don't understand often because they grew up they they, they know what it was like to, to starve you know like mm -hmm. I started my own businesses I was the CEO the janitor the fill in the blank the orderer the whatever right mm -hmm. but as you grow and you've got 20 30 40 employees like 24 hours in a day it's they what they do is they just add to themselves and they become inefficient jack of all trades master of none and they do 20 products ter projects terribly instead of five projects great mm -hmm. and they don't delegate some of the stuff that doesn't make any time and literally and i know it sounds very simple but the aha moment is like oh now i see it and i said by the way show me you know i know you showed me your onboarding process tell me your hire process or i was looking at both of them and we had swapped i was like and your name's in here too how many people do you guys interview and hire oh we do five or six of these a week really how about a i don't know a virtual assistant to send the emails out for you you know it's sometimes just very simple for someone on the outside looking in. But I see business owners waste a ton of time and do things that they shouldn't. You should not be looking envelopes and stamps and coordinating meetings and those sorts of things. That is not a productive use of your time. And you should be focused on, one, what you're good at, okay. and two, that helps to generate revenue. So one of the statistics I like to say is, 80% of all revenue is generated by just 20% of what a business owner does. Yeah. Just 20%. Okay, now I don't want to hear the joke about 20% of the work is done by, you know, or 80 percent of the work is Pareto's done by 20% of the people. Yeah. yeah, the Pareto, right? But seriously, when it comes to a business owner, just 20% of what they do drives 80% of the revenue. Think about it. How, what do yeah. they do in accounting? They're doing, 
you know, email. They're doing things that aren't generating revenue. So how – you're not going to change that so, math. So you're telling me I need to be doing less work as far as the non No, I'm saying you need to be more effective, <laughs> I'm more effective. <laughs> You know, so but you shouldn't be answering the door. You shouldn't be filling the refrigerator full of water because I would much rather have you. I am doing that. A prospect. I am doing that now because Katie's out on maternity leave. So it's like because <laughs> <laughs> if I, if she wasn't here, she'd be doing it, and yeah. now it's not being filled because I'm the one that has to do it. Because you quit? Did you quit already? Or <laughs> yeah. just, I'm just have like, you oh, failed at it. Shit, I gotta do that. <laughs> yeah. I failed at it. has failed at filling the refrigerator. It's not, it's not full worth of water. my time. Yeah. but seriously, it, it is a big problem, and I yeah. see them in min- not menial. I don't. You know, I don't want to uh, denigrate anybody, and you know, but there's certain roles and responsibilities that people should be in. And, well, the and owners the are time meant to, be spent. to grow the business, not to operate it. Yeah, well, and then you, God, you're just killing me here with these great uh, segues, which is, you know, I talk to business owners also, and this kind of gets back to the original comment, which is how much time are you spending in your business versus on, on your business? And a, and a lot of business owners don't understand how much they get. They spend so much time in their business. They never have a time to think strategically. Where am I going? Yep. What are my competitors doing? Yep. Very important. How, yeah, and, it, you're right. And that's bringing it full circle, right? Because we started this conversation with how few business owners sit down and just talk about what their most valuable value proposition I mean, is to put in front of people. <laughs> and cool. and, and I, there are so many times we've had meetings and it's like a blank face. It's like, I never thought about that before. Yeah. I mean, you from know? the outside so, looking at YouTube and, you know, growing yeah. together with you guys, it's like, you know, the cigar lounge, mm-hmm. like actually whiteboarding everything out. Who do we want to acquire? Why do we want to acquire? Who do we want to work with? Why do we not want to work with these people? Who yeah. do we want to fire? How do we want to hire? Yeah. And then, where do we want to be? Location, location, location. That's all working on it, not in it. And then, of course, you guys, you know, were at first building the websites, and then you're like, oh, this is not worth our time. We need to be in B&I meetings. We need to be in sales pitches. We need yep. to not do all the low-level stuff. That's when yep. you brought me on. Like, it yep. just kind of cascaded out. And now look at where you're at. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you know, to the minute. Yeah. Right? Yep. Uh, and that, that on the business allows you to really pay attention to what's going on. Yeah. Otherwise, you end up like Circuit City, like how they work out. <laughs> yeah, they're all right. commission. Or you too. look at all this you know, stuff. Yeah. You know, Circuit City is still around. Yeah, the virtual. Right, it's, a web, it's just a website. <laughs> website, but I, but I think if you look at it, is if you think about it, they didn't pay attention. They really weren't looking at the right things. They didn't really appreciate what was going on around them. Never spent the time to do it. Comfortable, right? And that's a perfect opportunity to get shellacked and have somebody come in and disrupt you in a way that you never expected. Yeah, just like Blockbuster, Netflix. Yep. 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 You know, uh, it's Red funny because I know. worked at Best Buy that was across the street from Circuit City. <laughs> and we always had those meetings on differential between, you know, Circuit City and Best Buy. We were paid hourly. We weren't paying commission. It was on a value base of getting the customer what they needed and not trying to upsell them. And that, w- and that time was at 2009, mm-hmm. like around that 2010, somewhere around there. So having that value add that we were talking about earlier was detrimental to Circuit City that they didn't have because they were just trying to sell people stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and people yeah. didn't want it. Well, this is uh, sometimes I want to be sold when I go into Best Buy. What? <laughs> <laughs> but when I walk into Best Buy now, I get I don't get any help. <laughs> yeah. Like it's finding an employee. It's like hello, hello, right? Hello. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Very That's minimal. Yeah. Right. This has been fantastic. I I think there are so many great nuggets out of what you said here, and I think it is Maybe so one. applicable to all different industries yeah. and types of businesses. I think one question we haven't asked is that the biggest of your whole entire career, plus your business, the biggest takeaway that you, or advice, rather, just one out of everything that you can give, what would it be to new business owners? You better have a strategy mm. because somebody else is working on it and they're, gonna, they're hungry. They're going to come take your business. I mean, my job as a CEO is to put my competitors out of business. Somebody's working it somebody's going to outdo you and if you're not paying attention and you don't under, you, you don't really have a handle on your business and you're not putting in the plans the tactics those sort of things one of the biggest things i tell you know i have a platform called strategile um, and what it does is it helps build strategic plans i really use it in conjunction with you know consulting and coaching with my clients but the little tagline is um, you know your strategy that lives beyond you know january 1st why how many strategies are created? January 1st. January 1st. Set on the shelf, collect dust, <laughs> blow it off on December 15th, update it, put it back. It's 800 pages. No one reads it. It's not really a strategy in place. So it actually, I should say, building and executing a strategy. I, got I thought you were going to go strategy. I thought you were going to go like agile with that. 
Yeah. So it's agile and strategy. 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 On that note, this is to expand upon that, and then we can end the podcast. Um, this is not an attack on you, James. Oh. This is reference right, right. to someone. Oh, gosh. On well, that get him. Just when it what, predicates with that, is what, that an attack? What do you do of when you don't have a business partner that's in line with what you just said? So, like, Ooh. like Fight that person, one Fight person has one. a strategy, and the other person is just like, eh, I don't care. I'm comfortable. Yeah, those are some usually some pretty ugly coming to Jesus meetings. And uh, that's either get on the same page or somebody needs to get out. And I don't mean that, like I said, in a negative way, but I can't tell you how many times exactly what you just said. Two people come together. They have diametrically uh, different uh, opinions or perspectives about where the business should go. And I'm not going to say it's an easy way to rectify it is, but one way is to really bring in a third party to help drive and tease out who's a neutral Mm -hmm. arbiter essentially to help um, arrive Mediator. at a joint kind so of solution. Yeah. I, it's a great I, question. I had a short time. I had a small real estate uh, flipping business. Try to do it part-time. Um, mm. A business partner kept comparing himself and our business to and it. And this was not me, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, I automatically thought it was, but go ahead. No. But I kept, that was kept comparing us to other people in the industry that do it full-time. Like all they do is real estate, uh, wholesaling and buying and flipping properties, or buying and holding properties, building air, all that stuff. That's all they do full time. While he's a full time employee, I'm mm-hmm. a full time employee and business owner, and you're comparing us to that, and then you're not happy with the results that we're generating. I'm like, do I understand your strategy and where you're trying to go with, but like, you, you got to stop comparing yourself to other people too. Well, here's what I would say. At least from and, a results and, standpoint, I don't, I don't, you know, if you need a tissue after, well. James will get you on. (laughs) I think that my response to that is the upfront work before you became partners was not clarified because that was correct. Yeah. Had you been on the same page that this is a lifestyle, it's a side hustle, it's a fill in the blank, that never would have been an issue or you never would have gotten into that relationship. What I tell people about business partnerships is you're getting married. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And divorce. We well, argue like yeah. a married impl- couple. Yeah. I, I <laughs> have it. It's, it's uh, yeah. conflict. But it is actually good yeah. if you can argue fairly, fight yeah. fairly, right? Even in your marriage or it's your you business partnership bitch. or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, now I saw you throw something across the room. The video catch me on the skin. So, but seriously, um, what I would most often tell you is business owners you know before they get engaged they're dating they first just think about the awesomeness the greatness Honeymoon and we're going to make money and you know blah 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 and they don't get in of how long do you want to be in the business what do you want to get out of it yep. how much are you willing to put in oh by the way if we want to get divorced what does that look like that's where i'm at now so i merged so i merged my franchise with a bunch of others so we ended up having seven locations 192 employees what we put in there because there were some concerns about the ownership and those sort of things is if we could not all agree the person who could not agree would request an arbiter to come in the third party arbiter to come in but they had to pay for it okay if there was a disagreement <laughs> And so if you don't like the answer, so let's say you yeah. two agree, I disagree, I don't like the answer, I, I'm allowed to push the stop button, but to bring in an arbiter and they would help to negotiate, but I had to pay for it. So there was remedies put into place to address disagreement that is often missed in partnerships wow. and painful. Yeah, yeah. I've huh. seen businesses implode, like 90, $100 million businesses implode because there was a disagreement. It's a very good strategy because if you're not able to uh, resolve conflict, communication just stops. And you're done. You, and you stop yeah, talking, absolutely. And I have seen them swirl the drain. Yeah. There was a collection business that I uh, was in, not involved in, but was consulting more on the IT side many years ago. And uh, all the brothers got in the big argument and imploded that business. Took it from 100 million to 20 million and they ended up selling you know, pennies on the, yeah. on the deal. Yeah. Tragic, yeah. right? They're talking about multi-generational extreme wealth, too. Don't get me wrong, twenty million is great, but they not a hundred million. Three ways, yeah. And, yeah, three ways after taxes. On, on it's not life changing. Yeah. On se. the real estate flipping stuff, we he s- wanted to, my business partner at the time wanted like essentially skipped over deals because the profit margin wasn't good enough. Even though profit wasn't be made, let's see, this is a side hustle. Like there was a property that the seller wanted to sell it for three thirty. 
and the, the most he would offer him was three twenty eight. I'm like, Dude, it's walk two, for two grand. grand, and because he was so focused uh, on the finite number and the percentage, because again, he had to split it with me too, so it's a fifty fifty. So he was so finite on that number, mm-hmm. and didn't offer uh, uh, the guy didn't take the deal. Another wholesaler came in, offered him the three thirty, and the house ended up selling for uh, like almost four hundred thousand. Are you in counseling for that? Um, <laughs> So uh, they made forty thousand dollars in profit, or whatever. Whatever it yeah. needed, just yeah. uh, paint and lipstick. That's all it needed. It was very basic stuff. That's painful. Paint for whatever it sold for, lipstick? they yeah. made paint. And li- whatever paint and lipstick. It's like that. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, it's it that person made forty thousand dollars because he gave him the two thousand because he was that's so frustrating. focused. That yeah. pissed yeah. me that's off. But that's the so, that's the principal nature. I mean, that's like a Dr. Phil, Oprah Winfrey thing, right? Yeah. I mean, like. That, that, that's the, that, but that's important about when you get into these relationships. You know, I always tell people, if you don't have to have a partner, don't get one. I know it sounds terrible, but you should be complimentary. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, you need the T's and C's and all that sort of thing into your agreement. But you really have got to drive deep. And I think what happens is people get started. They fall in love with the, the concept, the idea, and the going into business and what they're going to bring and yada, yada. And everything is going to be hunky-dory. It's Just like marriage. Marriage, marriage is ups and downs and those sort of things, and it's a lot of hard work. And, you know, um, if the motives aren't aligned, if philosophies are not aligned, the mission, and, and you are genuinely and really do believe in the agreement, it's it's bad news. Yeah, that's, a, that's yeah. where I'm at now, um, kind of in this dating phase with a potential partnership. Yeah, my question like, was more <laughs> reference to him, not yeah. to you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, it's those expectations. It's a, it, they're, they're a family owned business and the, you know, husband and wife both have a, you know, equity share into it. It's like, Hey, by the way, if I come into this, what's going to happen to me yeah. and setting all those expectations up and talking it all out. What do we want to turn the business to? Well, how does yeah. conflict resolution? So we, we actually just had that conversation. yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And you need to be, really what's good. the exit strategy and, yep. and all that and good he, stuff. He, that's, and I was like, why voting. are you, you know, you've been doing this business for 20 years. Why now? That's a great question uh, too. You know, are, are you looking for successor? Like, are you yeah. looking for I, this stuff? And, and I think someone take everything over? you need, yeah. and here's the other big thing I'll say, and like I said, I don't know how long this podcast goes for, but you got to listen to your gut. Yep. You know, too many Always people trusted. override the gut because they want it, you know, yeah. and, and whether you're religious or not or whatever it may be, but you need to listen to your gut. If your gut says this is doesn't smell right, it probably doesn't. Mm-hmm. And if it's too good to be true, it probably yes. is. Yep. And you do have to ask yourself, why are they getting out? Why are they selling now? Mm-hmm. Why, 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 why? And you have to get comfortable with that because if they're trying to take money off the table, they may be afraid. They may be afraid for the business. Let me tell you, these bu- these business owners who list these businesses don't always sell them when they're, you know, or, um, they don't. If if they believed that it was going to make them hundreds of millions of dollars in the future, they would never sell the. Yeah. They're selling the business for a reason, unless it's health, that's really retirement or whatever. But when I see a thirty year old, who's like, um, yeah, I'm selling this business because you know I have other interests. Or whatever, like eh, eh, red, red flag, flag. Yeah. red flag. Actually, what they see is this thing's in trouble, and they're trying to get out. Because almost every business you see, you'll see the dip and then the listing. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That's a good close. Yeah. This has been enlightening. Yeah. Stay no this doubt. long. Thank you for listening so, to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for tuning into the Think Fresh Move Four podcast. Um, our episode next week is with a. It's all about restaurants again. We're gonna have. Um, uh, the CEO and founder of Burgerbach on. Cool. That is cool. That so, is really cool. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Listen.